Ten years ago, my husband dragged me along to that place. I wanted to go to Jane Austen's cottage in Bath, but he, Damien had just qualified as an archaeologist, and he wanted to go to Stonehenge first, so I dutifully tagged along. I had no idea that within the hour, my entire life would change and it would derail my PhD thesis. I was working on the way Indigenous cultures memorise vast amounts of information. Now, I was born with the pathetically bad memory, and this I realise now is a blessing because it made me ask the question which changed my life. How the hell do they remember so much stuff? One example, the Navajo people, we've got records of them memorising 700 insects, fully classified, all the details about them, and they store the lot in memory. Now, that's just insects. Add in all the animals and the plants and navigation and genealogies and land management laws, all stored in memory. How the hell do they do it? And I found that all the cultures in my research use very similar methods, and one thing they do right around the world is associate information with the landscape. And so you'll find that Aboriginal songlines, Native American pilgrimage trails, the Inca secas, the uh, ceremonial, ceremonial roads of the Pacific Islanders, they're all exactly the same thing. They're very powerful memory techniques. And so there I am, standing on the windy plains of Salisbury, looking up at some great big stones, and I thought to myself, well, hang on, these guys didn't have writing, they must have used these methods too. But, and then I started looking at it and saying to myself, well, hang on, this is obvious, I know what they're doing. But Stonehenge didn't look like that for the first 500 years. Those big guys, the Sarsons, weren't there. It looked more like this. Now, that's not a 5,000-year-old photograph. It's the Ring of Brodga on Orkney, but essentially Stonehenge was the same, about 100 metres across with about 56 stones around it. They now think those are the blue stones from Wales, the smaller ones. Uh, 56 stones around. And I thought to myself, well, hang on, they're just on the merge of settling. So if you've got your knowledge system around the landscape and you're settling, you need to localise it. Clever guys, obvious thing to do is to bring in each of those locations for the ceremonial cycle and make it a localised version, and that's why there's thousands of these circles all over the place. So I'm walking around, you know, with my tourist earmuffs on, listening to them, waiting for them to talk about practical knowledge, memory, any of this, and none of it was mentioned. So we dashed through the gift shop, because you're always funneled through the gift shop, and I found the first book I could by a bona fide archaeologist, and I looked in the index. Memory, knowledge, mnemonics, no no mention of it. But what he did say was that these people left no written record. Now, people who do not have writing do have an alternative. It's called a rality, O-R-A-L-I-T-Y. It's my field of research, and a rality is what you have when you don't have literacy. And it's a massive swag of memory devices that are incredibly effective. And so I thought to myself, wildly excited for 10 minutes, I've got a new theory for Stonehenge. At the end of the 10 minutes, I went, yeah, right. There's no way I would have thought of something that nobody else has thought of. Other people have thought of it. Obviously, why it's wrong. Let's get on with PhD. Except I couldn't get rid of that idea. You see, these memory methods are incredibly robust. We have evidence from Australia of stories that date back five, seven, ten thousand years of landscape changes at the end of the Ice Age held through oral tradition for ten thousand years. That is phenomenal. And it's been verified by science. So how do they do it? The best way I can explain the simpler entry for this is the way the Greek and Romans used a simplified version of it. Homer, Cicero, Augustine, when they were waffling on for hours and hours and hours with their talks, they were using a memory palace. It's called Memory Palace, Method of Loci, all these different things, names for it. But essentially, what they were doing was using a building 
or a streetscape as a landscape, and placing a piece of that knowledge in every location. And then they, when they got up here and started waffling on, they imagined themselves walking through that landscape and recalling each little part as they went. Now, there's a reason this method is so universal. It's the common factor we all have: the human brain. The neuroscience recently has been showing that memory associated with place is extremely strong. It is the most robust way, and all memory champions today still use this method. So there I was with this new theory, and Damien, with his archaeology hat on, said, "Well, hang on. If your theory is right for Stonehenge." Then it's also got to be right for every monument in the world built in that transition from a mobile culture, not nomadic, mobile, just moving between resources, to the settlement. Nazca lines, Chaco Canyon, Easter Island.、Uh, there's tons of them. It's got to fit them all. Damien cheerfully called this my theory of everything. I tearfully fell in a heap. And couldn't go on. The self-doubt absolutely destroyed me. So Damien said, "We can't afford a psychiatrist. <laughs> We're going to fly back to England because it's cheaper, and <laughs> sit down with a Neolithic archaeologist and thrash this out, and then get rid of it. Get back on your thesis." So we did. We went to Avebury and met with Dr. Ros Cleal, the lead archaeologist and Stonehenge expert. Uh, and we sat down with her for two days. It was supposed to be one hour because she gets lots of nutters with Stonehenge theories, <laughs> but she accepted it, and we went on. And she got me to come back the next day. We went for two days, and at the end, she said to me, "This theory is well worth pursuing. There is no elephant in the room." That. Is what Avebury was like originally. There is no better design of a. A memory palace, and、uh, public and restricted all the different things. So for the next five years, I started working on all the things I could learn from indigenous cultures, from Aboriginal, Pacific, African,、uh, Native American cultures, on how they manage these memory systems, and I could find it in the archaeology. The reason, and it gave, giving me reasons for things. Those guys at Avebury built a one-kilometre ditch right round it, at parts that's ten metres deep, deeper than this, dug into stone using deer antlers, and they made sure the bottom was flat. There's been no explanation before, but use the indigenous reasons for ceremony, and it all makes sense.、Uh, but it also explained why they had all these funny little objects that. You'll find in archaeology sites objects like those: the Stonehenge carved sto- stone pl- carved plaques, chalk plaques. I'll get that eventually.、Uh, they have those, and they're ba- vaguely mentioned as ritual objects or enigmatic objects with no practical purpose. Now, indigenous people do not put a lot of work into carving things for no practical purpose.、Uh, So my theory started explaining all of this stuff. So I went on, got the PhD. It was examined by leading archaeologists, published as an academic monograph by Cambridge University Press, no less, and then、uh, a trade book, the Memory Code that was mentioned, that's here, published here and overseas. And I kept going. I started putting, trying the different methods. I tried the landscape ones, but I also started looking at these portable devices. Now, sometimes when you get into research, I'm a foundation member of the Australian Skeptics, and I have my limits what I'm going to believe. <laughs> They claimed it's ridiculous, I know. The, the Luba people of West Africa took a bit of things like that, the real ones on your left, and encoded an entire knowledge system to a bit of wood. With some shells and beads nailed on, so I wasn't going to fall for that. But I tried it. I grabbed—that's the middle one there. I grabbed a bit of wood. They were building a veranda at the time, so that's an offcut. Now you know what a veranda is built out of. 
glued on some beads and shells and started encoding. And what I encoded, I started up here, the 412 birds of our uh, of Victoria. And so I started with 412 birds encoded to this, yeah, right. So I started with the first one, which is Dromaea Day. The a day was for everyone, so first family. I had to get drum, drum onto there, and it's the emu. Well, an emu looks like a kettle drum, doesn't it? Drum, this is my opening bird. That was fine, that was easy. This next bead is the ducks, a natter day. I've got 16 ducks to encode to that, but if you look carefully, and I'm sure you can see it from there, there's a little speck that looks like a duck's tail. In fact, it looks like it's wagging at me at the moment. So I had to get 16 ducks onto that. So we've got the magpie goose and the swan. So I made up a story about the magpies and the swans in a footy match where things got a little out of hand, which is why we have the Australian shoveler to bury the dead. The musk ducks off seducing someone in the bushes. The hard heads got really, really violent, which is why we have a pink-eared duck and a blue-bill duck. And I repeated that story a number of times, and I had 16 ducks encoded to that. I then got the whole 82 families on, and it worked so well, I was shocked. I then had one made, like theirs, designed for what I wanted to put on it, and it is unbelievably effective. I could not believe it myself. My skepticism got knocked. And I found that these devices are made by cultures all over the world. There's just a few of them up there. For example, the Aboriginal Charinga, the back of a Kulamon, which is in the middle there, message sticks and all the rest. Maori genealogy staves over that. I don't know which side you're on the knotted cord device of the Inca Kipu, lots of Native American things like the Ojibwe birch bark scrolls, and that one's the Winnebago songboard. These physical memory devices were absolutely everywhere. And they are also in the archaeology. So I had added these in. But what you can do in memory is incredible. So I have my landscape ones where I've encoded uh, the 242 countries and independent protectorates of the world in population order, and I've encoded the um, uh, hundreds of historic events and people in another song line. I've encoded all these things into the system. So I had taken methods under orality, the theory, where they talked about song and dance and performance and vivid stories with wild ac actions, which we call mythology. Indigenous cultures, those are all memory devices. They make things more memorable, which is why they perform all their knowledge. And what I'd added in was these memory devices, the physical devices. Now, I've now got about 10 kilometers of landscape mapped out around my home uh, of the, all those things I've been talking about. I've added in memory palaces for French verbs and for Chinese radicals and so on. I am so incredibly attached to my devices. That's the most precious thing going, it's worth nothing to anyone else. And to my landscape, I can't move from the house I'm in. <laughs> now, I've been doing this for about three or four years. Aboriginal people have done it all their life, and their parents' life, and their grandparents' life, and thousands of years back, Native American, the same. Native American were moved off their land into reservations. Hey, mate, this is better land, what are you grizzling about? moved away, they called it the Walk of Tears. Our Aboriginal people, there is their song lines, which are their entire encyclopedias, and fences were placed across them. And they were shot if they crossed that fence to their song lines. The physical cruelty was horrible, but the intellectual cruelty was just as horrific. I got pretty um, 
involved in all this memory stuff, so I decided in a fit of madness to enter the Australian Memory Championships. That's where we memorised shuffle decks of cards and great long strings of numbers, including binary, one, zero, one, 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 zero, one, one. Totally useless stuff. But what I've discovered at 66 is that my memory, my concentration, my focus is better than it has ever been in my life. So why aren't we teaching these methods in schools? We don't have to change anything else. They have been taught every culture, including Western cultures, into medieval, they were taught in all schools, and into the Renaissance. We don't have to have a new subject, we don't have to do anything else other than enhance what we've already got. The recent neuroscience shows that our brains do not have a use-by date. Plasticity does go on if you keep using it. There's been experiments with uh, older people, uh, early onset dementia, using memory palaces and music, showing that they respond to this in their identity. And they're showing very successfully, why are we waiting till then? Why aren't we embedding our knowledge, our identity, in our songs and in our landscapes way earlier and delaying, if not preventing, dementia in many cases. Now, if you've forgotten everything I've said so far, that's fine. <laughs> Don't forget this one thing. You can memorize anything you want to. You've just got to know the methods. Thank you.